Harley. You loot the safe while the boys and I set up. Right away, Mr. Jack. Yes, I admit it. As unprofessional as it sounds, I've fallen in love with my patient. Pretty crazy, huh? For a character like Harley Quinn, it is easy to get caught up in the brilliance. She's a character that was so compelling, so entertaining, that she took what was supposed to be a one-off single appearance role in 1992 and stretched it into an iconic legacy that has existed over 30 years. Her cultural impact is undeniable. We've grown up to see various versions of her, from classic Harley to talk show host Harley, unhinged sex fiend movie Harley, DC Comics Deadpool Harley, LGBTQ parody Gotham City Harley. Like the Batman, there's a Harley Quinn for every audience. And I love that. But I do have my preferences. What made this character so iconic wasn't just her comedy, the versatility of her character design, or Arlene Sorkin's amazingly iconic voice. It was the tragedy that her story represents. The tragic fictional reality that Harley Quinn became what she did because of her abusive relationship with the Joker. A deep appreciation of this tragedy. That part seems to be lost on us. And in this video, I've made it my mission to remind you of it. And the best way I know how to do so is by putting you in her position. And by asking a simple question. What if Harley Quinn was never in love with the Joker? Now, imagine yourself in her shoes. You. A young woman with no superpowers at all live in a world full of superheroes and villains. People who fly in the air, speedsters running faster than sound or light, and other entities wielding forces of nature that could bend reality like a piece of paper. And then there's you. A young woman living in Brooklyn, New York in a dysfunctional family with no superpowers at all. And after you accept the fact that you share a planet with these metahumans, to yourself, you think, Exactly how do they think? What are the daily thoughts of a man they say is made of steel? What crosses the mind of a person whose ego doesn't shatter into fear after willingly jumping off a building with no protection? How does a divinely favored immortal princess experience self-esteem? You become obsessed with these kinds of ideas, and like all brilliant people with brilliant ideas, these thoughts begin to guide your actions and pull your focus until you find that precious bit of information that unlocks your destiny. One word, the word, psychology. What motivates the Flash to save people rather than robbing them faster than they can blink? Why doesn't Aquaman take hostage of a country by threatening to sink all its coastal cities? Why won't the Batman kill? You need to know. So you dedicate your life to pulling back the curtain on metahuman psychology. A few years pass and you graduate high school with good grades, years of expert level extracurricular gymnastic training, a powerful intellect, a relentless sense of ambition, and a reputation for seducing professors who don't comply with your ambitions. Clearly, you are willing to go above and beyond to get what you want. And the day has finally come where all your work has paid off. Congratulations! You have been accepted to Gotham City University on an athletic gymnastic scholarship. We are honored to welcome you to our prestigious Doctorate of Psychology Graham. program. Miss Harley Quinzel. Quinzel. You chuckle, you under, chuckle your under your breath. Because most, because call, most you call you Harley. Eight years pass. And you have graduated Gotham City University with your degree in psychology. Shortly after leaving GCU, you begin your residency to earn your psychiatry degree. And while there, something interesting happens. During your residency, you have seen thousands of patients. And they are fascinating at first. But your ambitions are hungry. Your ego is inflated and your mind has become jaded. Harleen has become bored with her own obsessions. Bored with her own questions. But why? 
You were so sure of yourself, so motivated to understand the minds of these gods. Where has this self-doubt come from? And yet, something about these recent patients you've been seeing, specifically those more sinister ones, the criminally minded, they feel so much more fulfilling, so much more fascinating. They feel like home. And that's when it hits you. When you first asked the question about these metahumans, you didn't just ask what they were thinking about, but why they dedicated their powers to good instead of evil. The psychology of their morality, that was your true passion. It was time to commit yourself not to the minds of the gods, but to the minds of the demons. Criminal psychology in the meta-human population, that was your true target. But remember, you are ambitious and you must always satisfy those ambitions. So you can't just go after any criminal. You gotta go after the biggest bad of them all. So the next steps are clear. You transfer to Arkham Asylum. You establish your professional expertise in spite of your young age. And after only three months of rigorous convincing, the administration finally gives you your first session with the Joker. Now, Harleen, your family was a series of multi-layered monsters, abusers, con artists, master manipulators, and the Joker is all of that, and more. But this isn't enough to stop you or sway the force of your ambition. Your family put you through the equivalent of a hands-on, one-on-one extended criminal psychology course. You are built for this. No one in this world could deal with the Joker the same way you can. So you prepare your notes with confidence. You study all of his listed manipulation tactics, comparing them to the criminal minds of your personal and professional past. You dive deep into the horrors and the atrocities committed time and time again to desensitize yourself to his tricks and schemes. You show up on time and await his arrival until finally you are sitting in your chair face to face with the clown prince of crime. He speaks first and mentions his father. How he was an awful abuser who tended to favor the grape. And in a drunken rage, his father would often strike him while he was doing absolutely nothing. He goes on to share memories he had when he was seven years old of the one time he remembers seeing his father be happy during a trip to the circus. His father laughed at the clowns. How when the Joker later attempted to make his father laugh by imitating those clowns, his father rewarded him with a broken nose. How he was always taking hits from people who never got the joke and how his father's abuse is reminiscent of his many bouts with the Batman. Amidst his sharing of his dark past, he makes a light joke about your name, Harley Quinn. How it reminds him of the Harlequin jesters of medieval times. You chuckle under your breath. The Joker is funny, charming even, in a ghoulish sort of way. And as an empathetic person, you cannot help but relate to his stories of abuse. But you know he's a manipulator. You know what he's doing. The Joker was trying to manipulate Harleen into falling in love with him. But rather that, she developed a plan to undercut his manipulations and play them to her professional advantage. The ultimate goal of any criminal psychologist is to cure their patient's pathology. The Joker was a patient unlike any other and would need a treatment plan like no other. A revolutionary treatment where Harleen would sow herself deep into the Joker's criminal world, gain his trust and steer his mind out of its criminal direction from within the crime world itself. It would be revolutionary, the ultimate outpatient treatment. But to perform her outpatient treatment, she would first have to get her patient out. The next steps were clear. Harleen broke into a costume shop, stole an outfit in her size, themed to her patient's liking, and proceeded to Arkham Asylum in the dead of night. Using her advanced intellect and superior gymnastic skills, she snuck into the facility, locating the Joker's cell. 
It would have been simple enough to clandestinely sneak him out of there using the security clearance granted to her by her job, but that wouldn't have established her as trustworthy in the Joker's eyes. She knew that she needed to make a show of it to gain his trust. So when she opened the door to his cell, revealing herself, the Joker saw a curtain rise on his new accomplice, clad in red, white, and black, dressed from head to toe like a jester of old. Harleen Quinzel had become Harley Quinn, the clown princess of crime. The two of them broke out of Arkham in a literal blaze of glory. From Harleen's perspective, phase one of her plan was a success and the outpatient treatment had begun. She was about to deal with the Joker's psychology in a way no one ever did. And she was right about this. And she knew it. But what she didn't know is just how right she was. Days turned to weeks. She committed crime after crime, meeting his henchmen and aiding in his hijinks, going toe to toe with Batman on occasion, pretending to be in love with the Joker, playing on his ego as she danced with him in the pale moonlight, swaying the direction of his crimes, learning the ins and outs of his mind. She even developed an exaggerated way of speaking and a dull witted way of acting to further influence the Joker's self-absorbed ego. She would have to take time to herself and drop the act while alone in order to make space for her sanity on occasion. But he was falling for her fake pick-me-girl swooning exactly as planned. Things were going well at first, but then the Joker began to get physical with her. Hitting, slapping, punching, verbal abuse, emotional manipulation. Harley took it all on the chin, sometimes literally. It didn't sway her. She was built for this after all. She knew what he was doing, abusing her to test that trust that she had worked so hard to gain. He noticed that. So the Joker upped the ante. Harleen never saw someone tortured before. Then the Joker introduced her. Harleen never saw someone killed in front of her before. Then the Joker showed her. Harleen never killed before. Then the Joker made her. Harleen was used to being able to change clothes, but the Joker would force her to keep her outfit on for days on end. He couldn't change his twisted face, so he no longer gave her permission to remove her headpiece or clear off her makeup. Harleen was used to having private time to review her notes and assess her sanity. But she became too afraid to leave his side. He preferred her there. After all, he would kill his own henchmen just to finish a joke. Imagine what he would do to her if she disappointed him any further. And then there was Batman. You see, Batman was no misogynist. He was just as willing to hit a woman as he was to hit a man. Just as willing to hit her as he was to hit him. So the beatings were twofold and often. Both the Batman and the Joker would occasionally put Harleen in the hospital, bruised and broken. Many years passed, and she was no longer capable of tracking it. Like a police officer who had been undercover for far too long, the life was weighing on her. Her new personality began to erode her original one. Harley Quinn had trouble dropping the exaggerated version of her accent the psychopathic clown. that she invented for the Joker. She began to have cognitive issues due to the multiple concussions suffered from the Batman and the Joker's constant attacks. So she was actually becoming as brain damaged and dim as she was pretending to be. She had underestimated the scale of her patient's psychosis. It wasn't just his mind that overwhelmed her. She didn't foresee how difficult it would be to live in his underworld. He was the big bad for a reason, and now she knew why. The Joker didn't just break things, he broke people. At this point in the outpatient treatment, she had been witness to hundreds of murders that the Joker would do under the Batman's nose. 
deaths that he didn't care to make a show of because they didn't help him finish his mysterious existential punchlines. She would haul the rotting corpses out of storage into the streets for Gotham PD or the Batman and his allies to later find, setting up faux crime scenes to hide the Joker's tracks, mutilating these bodies meticulously per his instructions. She would engage in sexual acts with him at his request, often leaving those moments like that of a female cat, tortured and broken. It was rape and death and blood, day in and day out. She began to be even riskier when fighting the Batman and his many partners, antagonizing him more and more, allowing herself to get him so angry that he would break one of her bones just so she could spend some time away in the hospital. Away from him. The Joker noticed this and began to visit her, dressing as an orderly to torture her as she healed. He would waterboard her to imitate drowning, file her teeth, and replace them with poorly installed caps that would burn her gums, slice her eyelids open, just so, to deprive Harleen of sleep until they healed, and he returned to reopen those wounds. As he did so, he would brainwash her with his sick philosophies, telling her that he found it unfortunate that the definition of the word insanity gets so much more attention than the definition of the word hilarious. The definition of which, according to him, was to experience something so amusing that its ridiculous nature drives you mad, telling her how he figured out her plan a long time ago how she wanted to turn him sane, but all she ended up doing was driving herself insane, and how she should find that fact hilarious. One day, she changed tactics to end the abuse by making the Joker happy with her again. At this point in the outpatient treatment, Harleen had sustained too much mental damage to notice the parallels between her latest strategy and the stories that the Joker used to tell her about his father. Harleen proceeded to capture the Batman herself. She turned him upside down over a fish tank to make the piranhas within look like they were smiling. When the Batman realized the purpose of this plan, he laughed, throwing Harley's mind into a very vulnerable place. The Batman made it clear that he did not believe in her intentions, that she was foolishly trying to please a madman. The Batman filled her mind with a crippling level of doubt, and it was in that moment when the Joker arrived. The Joker found out what she was up to, how she was trying to tell the joke. So he rewarded her by throwing her out of a window. <laughs> She laid in the trash for what felt like hours, the last remnants of Dr. Harleen Quinzel dying within her eyes, her tears flowing and mixing with her blood. The paramedics found her in a semi-conscious state, as per usual. They took her to the infirmary at Arkham Asylum. She laid in the hospital bed, desperate for the pain to end for anyone to help her escape the mess she had created for herself, doubting her ambitions, dreading her decisions, and knowing that the one person who was really capable of dealing with the Joker had turned his back on her. No one was coming to save her. In that moment of dark realization, she looked at her nightstand and saw something a vase with a flower and a note that said, feel better soon, J. And she smiled, swooning the way she had been pretending to for so many years. In that moment, her mind finally broken. As a victim of relationship abuse, I understand what it's like to have your abuser change you into something you're not. 
someone you pretend to be for them and also don't even recognize for you. I like to believe that the person we know as Dr. Harleen Quinzel was never in love with the Joker, but the entity known as Harley Quinn, she was in love, a mad love. The many versions of Harley Quinn that we have gotten used to have at times downplayed this tragic element of the story, an element that is so important that without it, the character becomes unrecognizable. Her cultural impact twisted into an unhealthy caricature emulated by people who believe that what she was going through was romantic, that dating an abuser is okay as long as you can convince yourself that you love them and that they love you. If they are intentionally hurting you, they don't love you. While love may be a series of difficult choices that a healthy mind must consistently make, it should not be inherently maliciously painful. This story was fictional, but her pain was real. And Harleen Quinzel's legacy would be nothing without it. I felt it was important for someone to finally make people feel both sides of her story.